Hi guys, it's Christy again. Uh, today I'm going to be painting some terrain for you, which I know I've never really covered on this channel before, and it's not because I haven't wanted to. I guess I just haven't got around to it, but I'm going to be making more of an effort to do uh, terrain painting tutorials in the future, uh, kind of if and when opportunities uh, present themselves. Uh, so this week uh, I've got the following building that I'm going to be showing you. This is a kind of a stable or a barn in the French Belgian style, which you can kind of tell by all the plaster work, uh, natural stone and the tile roof. Um, this is in resin. It's by Total Battle Miniatures, which is a terrain company which is located in the UK and they do various scales, but they've got a particularly large range of 28 millimeter World War II stuff, which this is fun. However, since there's no sort of obvious sort of modern features on this building, or I should say mid 20th century features to this building, uh, you could easily uh, use it for earlier periods as well, like the Napoleonic era. Um, all of their structures are also kind of detailed inside and out. So you can see the roof lifts off on this building, and then I can kind of tilt it and show you. And it's got an interior. It's got sort of a loft, and then you can lift the loft out, and then it's got um, some stable type spaces down below. So the, their terrain is is very complete. It's really, really good if you're going to be doing skirmish war gaming where the interior of the building matters. Now, just a few uh, sort of important things I want to first talk to you about when it comes to painting uh, resident terrain like this and preparing it. Um, at least to the stage that I've got it at here. Obviously when you get resin buildings, most of them are going to need a little bit of cleanup. The same way as on figures, there's going to be sort of um, loose bits of resin and stuff left over from the casting that you need to kind of carefully scrape off with a knife. It's much easier with metal than with metal figures because of course it's a lot softer um, but you do have to be careful because it can be brittle sometimes you can end up breaking off bits you don't want. So you just want to look for any obvious um, places where you, that you think there's plastic or material that isn't really supposed to be there and you want to clean that up. Uh, the next thing that you need to do, and this is very, very important with resin terrain particularly, uh, I don't know if I, I want to go so far as to say it's essential, but it's probably essential, is you want to wash it really thoroughly. I mean, I advocate that you do that with your figures too, but with uh, resin terrain particularly, especially from slightly smaller manufacturers, there's often an awful lot of sort of mold release or chemical residue left on the buildings when you get them which will impact sort of the ability of paint to stick to the model so you really need to try to wash it to counteract it and one way you can do that is just to really scrub it thoroughly with um, warm water and dish detergent uh, or you can just kind of put it in a bucket of warm water and just let it soak for a while and you know that'll help it get clean too um, the other advantage to doing this is that especially new resin tends to be kind of stinky. It has a really unpleasant chemical smell a lot of times and washing it will really help to mitigate that uh, and make it just more pleasant to be around. Once your model is completely clean and dry, you're going to want to base coat it. Uh, you can do that in various ways. Uh, I use an air gun or an airbrush for this. <laughs> Sorry, an air gun, an airbrush for this because that's fast and uh, easy and it gives a nice thin, smooth, even coat that doesn't kind of obstruct details. Um, but another thing you could use is a spray can, just spray paint would be just perfect for this because resin is not really, shouldn't interact with spray paint so you should be fine with spraying it. Or you could just brush it on though obviously that's going to take quite a bit of paint. Uh, I often, and this is something I'll talk about a little bit more later, but when you're painting terrain very, very often you are not necessarily going to want to use the same paints you use on your models. Your, I mean, your figures like so Vallejo or Foundry or Citadel or whatever because they come in tiny pots and they're relatively expensive and if you use them on something like this, you're going to go through them really fast. So um, this is a point when I would probably advise, depending on the size and complexity of the building, buying some sort of artist grade acrylics that come in bigger tubes from an art store because it'll, it's just a way more affordable way to paint models like this and because you're not going for the same uh, complexity or the amount of sort of blending or shading or you don't need that sort of fine control uh, you really don't need to have such the sort of same grade of paints I guess as you would use on your fingers. Now in terms of color 
that you base coat your house or building with. It doesn't really matter a lot. You should you should probably think about how your house or building is going to end up looking and use and then sort of use that to figure out your base color. So, uh, for example, there's a lot of natural like gray stone work and stuff on this building. The roof is going to be a darker shade. So I went with a dark gray as my base coat. But if you had a white building with lots of like wood painted wood or plaster work mostly, then you might find it was easier to base coat your building with. Um, plast with, I mean, with a sort of a cream or white color because um, it ultimately it's just going to save you time and that's way, and that's sort of the effect of the time it's going to save you is way more magnified uh, than what it would be like on a figure. So now I'm just going to go ahead and go into some uh, basic techniques that you are going to be using to paint a, a simple structure like this one. Alright, so I want to start off here by talking about the paint that you're going to need for this project. Uh, this shows everything that you do need. And you can see I've got a big mix of uh, Citadel washes, which are really, really important for weathering and stuff, um, and a few um, Vallejo paints. I don't use them too much for terrain like this, and I sort of talked about this a little bit in the intro because you have to paint such big areas that it's not very practical or economical to work with them, but I do use them some just for detailing kind of smaller areas where I want an unusual color. What I mostly work with are those uh, paints in the back, which are artist acrylics, and they come in big tubes, so they're, they're just more economical for this kind of work. Uh, the colors you see there, there's a sort of a gray, a dark brown, a red, a brick color, kind of a cream, and also a white. And actually, while these are what you need for this building, with that range of colors, you can paint a big range of different um, architecture and terrain just by mixing the colors together. So you don't really actually even need very many of these to get very, very far with whatever you want to paint. Um, now, I would not recommend you get too much hung up on the brand of paint that you use. I'm using Winsor & Newton here, but that may not be available in your local area at your art store, so you should get whatever you can. Um, and, you know, just look for similar colors because the colors are pretty standardized. Things like Van Dyke Brown, Burnt Sienna, um, all those colors are made by multiple manufacturers. They're just, just they're, they're classical artist colors. The one thing I would definitely advise when buying um, artist acrylics is to keep in mind that you really get what you pay for with these paints. Uh, so, they tend to come in different ranges. They're sort of a cheaper budget student range often. Then you'll have a higher grade sort of professional range. Um, I try to buy the most uh, expensive ones that I can afford just because they work better. They tend to have better coverage, better pigmentation. Uh, they just dry better. They mix better. Uh, and so, you know, if you can afford to spend a bit more money on those, definitely do so because uh, it's it, it'll just it'll just make your whole... Uh, life a lot easier. I mean, that's not to say if you can't get anything but like, uh, you know, poster paint for like elementary school kids, if that's what you have access to, I'm sure you can use it. But I think you'll have an overall more pleasant experience if you just can spend a few extra dollars to get sort of the best grade of artist acrylic that you can find. So the first thing I'm going to start out doing here is base coating all of the stonework. Being a sort of French architecture, they use a lot of just gray natural stone. Uh, so I just took some of that um, Payne's gray that I had and I mixed it with some of the uh, titanium white to just create kind of a pleasant middle gray color and I'm just going to apply that. You want to really make sure you get down in all the recesses and cracks when you're doing this. And it goes without saying, you're going to want a nice big brush for this, not the small things you use for models. Um, and they, it doesn't have to be a particularly good brush either because it's going to get dirty and you're going to mix a lot of paint with it and it doesn't matter because you don't have to be doing fine work. Uh, I, what, the thing about terrain painting is it tends to be a really messy thing uh, compared to figure painting. You're, you're going to make a mess. You're going to get paint all over your work surface. Um, and what I like to do is after I get miniatures, you get those blisters. A lot of times those plastic blisters, they come in. What I like to do is cut them apart and then they make an ideal sort of palette for like these big amounts of paint that you need to mix up uh, for painting buildings. And then 
even better, you know, it keeps everything neat. And then when you're done, you can just kind of toss those away. You don't have to do any cleanup or worry about it because you probably have tons of the palettes. So I find that really an ideal way to work. Though, of course, you can obviously go for a more permanent solution if you like. Now I want to add a wash to the brick just to help define it better. And obviously a Citadel wash is not practical here because we're covering so much area. You just go through all of it in a blink and that would be a big waste of money. So I'm just making my own wash here. I've taken some of that Payne's Gray and I've just thinned it with a lot of water. You can see it's a mess. It's dripping and running everywhere because it, it's, it's a little um, less viscous than commercial wash. But it still works just fine. So you just want to kind of make sure this gets in all of the cracks in the stone and then just let it dry really well. Now we're going to start dry brushing the building. Uh, the, the paint mixture I've taken and used here is I've taken some of the titanium white. I have uh, darkened it somewhat with the paint gray, the paint's gray again, and I've added just a hint of Van Dyke brown into it just to warm it up a little bit so it's not so cold. But you know, I just wanted to point out here that uh, exact paint colors are not really that important here. So you shouldn't feel like you have to exactly replicate what I'm doing. You can make slightly different mixes with slightly different shades of gray and black and brown. It's still great, good, get great looking results. They won't be exactly the same as mine, but they'll still look good. And it, it doesn't have to be as precise, honestly. Uh, my dry brushing I'm doing here, I've got, and that's what I do all my dry brushing with, I use big, uh, sort of flat chisel shaped brushes with very, very stiff brush hair. That's what you want to look for. They should not be expensive brushes at all because you're going to ruin them from the dry brushing pretty quickly. But I recommend you sort of buy several different sizes of those for doing different areas. So you have a small one for fine detail dry brushing and then larger ones like this for doing whole walls. And you can see I'm applying it not completely evenly. So some areas I'm putting a heavier dry brush on and some areas I'm going to be putting a lighter dry brush on because I just don't make the whole, whole texture a lot more uh, varied and interesting looking. I just put, but basically you can see I'm just putting the paint on the brush here and then I wipe off a lot of it. And how much I wipe off is really going to depend on how um, intense that color is, especially relative to the base I'm putting over. So if I'm putting really light color over a really dark color, I'm probably going to wipe off almost all the paint because otherwise it'll be too intense. But if I'm doing a more subtle uh, shade over the base, then I won't wipe off nearly as much paint because otherwise you won't really see the dry brush very well. When I'm dry brushing anything, I almost always make two different layers of color. So I have a sort of a, a dark dry brush and then a light dry brush. And I've made my light dry brush here just by adding even more white into that base color. And now I'm just going over it again. And I tend to do this with a bit lighter touch, be a little bit more careful because it is so much brighter. And again, you can see I'm varying where I'm putting it, the direction I'm going, all kinds of stuff. The other thing I'm going to do once I have applied the dry brush is I'm going to use a smaller brush to kind of pick out some individual stones especially those corn, big cornerstones at the sides of the building. I'm going to um, pick those out a bit more and just make them look a little bit extra light. And, you know, even though um, it's the same color of paint, you'll get a different effect if you apply it just by normally brushing it on as opposed to applying it with a dry brushing technique. Now this is one of my favorite parts here. I'm going to start applying washes to the finished dry brush. Uh, I do this for various reasons. It just lets you really sort of add extra shading effects, uh, sort of get uh, different textures and colors in the in the sort of the finish, add weathering, all those kinds of things. And most point, or for the, the most part, I'm not doing really big areas here so it's fine to just use the citadel washes for this and you get good results so i'm doing various things one thing you can see i'm doing i'm using non oil at this point you can see how i'm picking out sort of doing a uh, pin wash sort of around all those big bricks which helps define them a little bit better and i'm also anywhere where i think there would sort of be shadows like see along that downspout i'm running a thick sort of line of wash there so it makes it look a little bit darker. I'm running it around those capstones on the doors. Just it, All this is just to really to add extra definition. And then I'm just going to take sort of random areas in the general brickwork and just sort of pick those areas out 
um, a little bit more just so that you get different color and variation in the weathering and you know kind of surface that you're looking at on the building. And now just because this is a gray stone building, there's absolutely no reason you can't work other colors in. I've got some Agrax or shade here, and I'm using that to, again, sort of selectively wash, particularly sort of just random areas of the brushwork, because stone uh, gets dirty, uh, it's weathered, it, uh, it's slightly different shades, and you can use uh, browns and sort of other colors like this just to add interest and in, in just texture overall. And I really have fun doing this. Uh, I apply different sort of amounts too, so sometimes I'll put kind of really heavy dark brown areas and sometimes I'll just brush it on very lightly and then blend it out with some water and that way you get just a whole bunch of a big range of tone and just all this nice different variation in the look of the uh, stone. I'm now going to grab the uh, buff titanium and I'm going to mix just a hint of the Van Dyke brown into it to make it slightly darker and I'm going to use that to base coat the plaster areas on this building. There's a little bit on the outside here and of course the entire inside is this color. Now there's nothing really hard here, you just have to be a little bit careful not to get on your brickwork. And uh, the other thing of course is you're applying a pretty light color over a really dark base coat so uh, even though this paint is well pigmented, you're probably not going to get a whole lot of coverage on your first coat, so you're going to probably have to go back in. I did. I had to put uh, two coats of paint down when I was doing this. Uh, just try to make sure you use nice, smooth, even strokes. I recommend that at least, and try to go always in the same direction. It's very much like when you're painting a house uh, <laughs> inside the walls and stuff. You want to think in the similar terms. and. Uh, inside can be tricky, of course, with a big brush like that because, you know, you, you can easily get paint on the floor, which you don't want. One thing to help with that is to use a nice flat chisel brush like I am. Uh, the other thing is, again, borrowed from actual house painting, kind of to cut in. In other words, don't go all the way to the floor with your big brush. Cover most of it with this, and then when you're done, go in with a small, fine detail brush and run it along sort of the, the edge between the wall and the floor, and that way you can avoid making uh, as much of a, a mess on the finished stonework. Now I'm going to base coat the roof tiles. This building has kind of a red roof. Uh, my base is a mixture of that permanent alizarin crimson with some burnt sienna in it. Um, now you can see here, again, there's coverage problems over the black and it's kind of, should be a little bit familiar. You can see just like with our model paints, the artist's acrylics have uh, pigmentation problems when it comes to red. They're very transparent. Um, and so you'll need a lot of coats to get this looking good. I think I put probably three or four layers on and I, it was still pretty dark even after I did that. Since I'm just generally base coating a whole bunch of stuff right now, I'm going to do the upper wood floor to the loft. I'm just going to apply a nice thick coat of the Van Dyke Brown to this. Uh, it's often very sensible when you're working on buildings like this where you've got these big areas of thick paint that are going to take a long time to dry that you just go in and base coat a whole bunch of separate areas at once and then you can just let them all sit and then they'll just all be uh, ready to go. Or, you know, work on one thing and then while it's drying go over and base coat uh, a different area that so that, you know, you can kind of rotate uh, them sort of the piece pieces drying and doing sort of detail and weathering work on the ones that are already dry. I'm now going to dry brush the plaster since I have a nice even coat and it's all dry. I have taken some of the titanium white and I have um, mixed that buff titanium into it to um, 
make it just a little creamier colored and you can see I'm applying a pretty aggressive dry brush all over the plaster because the shade difference is not very big that's why it's going to take a lot of pressure and you won't want to wipe too much paint from your brush um, and so I'm just going to do that uh, really inside and out on the entire model I'm next going to apply a, just a pure white dry brush to the plaster work and I'm trying to vary this a little bit so that I have some areas where you get like sort of a little bit of a more intense white uh, look and then some areas that are darker. You want things to be a little bit uneven and mottled when you're doing this because that's just more realistic and uh, natural and you know it'll just it'll just end up creating a more um, interesting building in the end. Uh, pay attention when you're doing inside surfaces where there's so, so any sort of outer corners, you want to put extra white on that so that they really stand out and get sort of a highlight, sort of so like this, sort of the wall, the top wall edges of uh, those stalls in the stable, for example. I'm now going to use some um, Agrex O Shade Wash to add shade and interest to the plaster work. I, I am first, there's some cracks which I'm highlighting, and then what I'm going to do is I'm just going to add some general discolored areas to the plaster work, areas that are dirty, maybe where there's some water has dripped down it uh, because that just looks more natural and stuff and you can see what I'm doing a lot here is I'm applying it and then I'm rubbing it out with my fingers and the reason that I do that is if you just apply it with a brush um, you can get too stark a line uh, whereas if you kind of do this you can blend it out just with your finger into the surface and it looks just it just looks more natural and this is a really easy way to do it you can of course always just uh, apply water and blend it out in a traditional way but I kind of like this rubbing technique I think that looks really good on architecture it makes it look sort of dirty and dingy and it's it's just it's a fast effective way to go on the inside I'm going to be really applying that brown on sort of all the inside corners or edges wherever there's a break between walls or surfaces I'm going to run that uh, dark brown color and this is almost in a way I kind of liken to like what you do on vehicles where you have panel shading where you have a sort of a lighter center and darker edges um, and it's, it, it sort of it tricks the eye a little bit to sort of shade the outside and leave the center light and it, it just emphasizes those areas and it just make, it, it's not necessarily realistic but it really gives a good effect on uh, miniatures like this and again I'm still using the trick of rubbing paint out where I feel like it and especially on these inside surfaces I'm tending to apply heavier uh, wash to around the base of the walls and it's particularly in the animal stalls there where those troughs are and such because uh, in a building of a structure inside the lower part of a wall is going to tend to get a lot more wear it's going to probably be a lot dirtier and dingier looking than sort of higher up on the wall and certainly I think an animal stall where there's something running around and leaving dirt everywhere is going to be really messy. So again, that's just something you can do to add more realism to your building, to have certain areas where you add more weathering because you think for whatever reason there would be just like more dirt and grime in that particular area. My roof is now really thoroughly dried, so I'm going to go ahead and dry brush it. Um, I started out with a dry brush of that uh, burnt sienna with a bit of the buff titanium mixed into it, and I just went over the whole surface. These tiles, the way that they're made, you really have to push really hard when you're dry brushing, and you don't want to wipe off too much of the paint. I found it does it take you don't so you don't at all need a light touch when you're doing this, at least with the first shade.
Now a roof like this is going to have quite a bit of variation in tile color. So one way I'm going to sort of be doing that is I'm taking a small fine brush and I'm taking that color I just used for dry brushing and I'm just carefully picking out some individual tiles here and there are groups of tiles just to, you know, sort of add that extra, you know, interest to the look of the entire thing. Uh, now I've made an even lighter dry brush color just by mixing more of the buff titanium into my base shade and I'm going over it. Again, heavily but not as quite as heavily with the last shade. And you can see there's some areas where I almost kind of went too far with that, but that's okay. With buildings, it's nice. You can't really usually mess them up too badly. You can always correct it. What I did then was go back in with some just pure uh, burnt sienna and kind of lightly brush over some of the areas that I got too light. And that just ended up looking better anyway because it just added even more variation and sort of shades to the roof tiles. Now I'm going to use washes to add even more interest. So I've got some Reichland Flesh Shade here, which is kind of a nice red-brown, which is ideal for this. So first I'm going to make a shadow just under those roof cap tiles and also just at the bottom near the gutter. And you can see I used my finger to blend it in. Then I'm going to go in, just like I did with that light-colored paint, and I'm going to use the uh, wash to pick out some individual tiles that are going to be a little bit darker than the rest. I'm even going to pick out some of the cap tiles in a separate color. And now I'm going to do that on both sides of the roof. Uh, and you can do it with more colors too. So after I went in with the Reichland Flesh Shade, I then grabbed some Agrex Earth Shade and I did a very similar thing. I picked out just a few tiles here and there. So then I added even a third sort of different tone to the tiles and I even added some sort of drips, uh, sort of lines coming from the top of the roof going down. Just, you know, again, just it's just all about building up texture and variety on the building because that's ultimately what's gonna make it look nice and make it look real. Now, this particular building is mostly made out of fieldstone or uh, graystone, whatever, but it has certain areas that have sort of been repaired or uh, changed using normal red brick. Um, I'm base coating those areas using Vallejo Sky Gray here, and that's sort of to simulate uh, the, the mortar between the bricks, and it's easier to sort of apply that mortar base first and then kind of paint the bricks on over top. While that mortar's drying, I'm going to base coat my doors and any of the woodwork on the building. Uh, and I opted to go for a dark green here because that's what Total Battle uses themselves. And I think it looks attractive. It contrasts well with the gray and the red. But of course, you could choose to use another color if you like. I'm using Vallejo German Camouflage. Um, extra dark green here. This shouldn't be too hard. It is, I'll admit, a little bit tricky sometimes to paint these sort of details on the inside of the building. That's one of the trickiest things about these sort of buildings with a finished interior. You really will have to do some serious contortions with your hand to try to get in all the recesses and cracks without making a mess on the finished walls. And as a matter of fact, you may find it easier uh, to paint these interior doors and then do the plaster walls afterwards. Uh, just because they're sort of on a lower level and you won't have to be quite so careful or turn the whole structure around so many ways just to uh, reach the areas that you need to paint. Once the mortar is dry, I'm going to take some Vallejo Saddle Brown and use a small brush, and it's not even very small, this is like a number two, I think, to carefully pick out all of the bricks. And you don't have to do a really, really good job of this. As a matter of fact, you don't want to. You certainly don't want to leave too big of uh, white mortar gaps between the bricks. It's better to have red bricks that completely touch each other than it is to always have huge amounts of white showing in between because that will look cartoonish and unnatural. And generally at a distance and after this whole thing has been weathered it's not going to really matter a whole bunch anyway 
So don't get too scared here. Um, painting bricks is always a pain in the butt because getting the mortar look can be tricky. But since we're working with relatively small areas of brick here, it's not such a big problem. And, we, and it, it'll take a little bit of time, but it shouldn't be anything that really is particularly onerous. Because that white mortar is still really, really stark and and really just too clean and bright looking, I'm going to help uh, uh, sort of tone that ta down and unify everything a bit more uh, just by uh, applying a light, thin wash of Agrax Earth Shade to everything. You can also, if you want, take some uh, white or cream and mix it into your saddle brown and use that to pick out some individual bricks and make them lighter or add some wash to make some darker. The same thing that we basically did when we were painting roof tiles a little bit ago. My uh, floor on the second story is now dry, so I'm going to dry brush it. I have taken some Van Dyke Brown and I have used it to slightly darken down that buff titanium shade. And you can see I'm just applying it all over the wood areas uh, and you can definitely vary this a little bit so you can see that there's some areas you can brush more heavily and some more lightly and that looks really good especially with like wood floors because you'll sort of simulate the idea that there's more wear in some areas than in others. Uh, I then just lightened uh, my color even further by adding more buff titanium to it and you can see I'm just again applying a pretty high dry brush to various parts of the wood just kind of selectively. I also wanted to point out real quick, uh, I'm not going to show it, but you should note that inside uh, the, the stable building there's a sort of a wooden ladder that's for climbing up to the uh, loft so make sure that you also paint that in the wood color so you base coat it with a Van Dyke Brown and dry brush it accordingly uh, while you're doing this whole process. I'm not going to add extra interest again to my floorboards the same way I did on the roof tiles using a series of washes. So I've got some Agrax Earth Shade here which I'm using is first to add some shading sort of around sort of any sort of corners or seams and kind of again blending it out with water in my finger. I'm then going to also uh, pick out sort of individual uh, boards using some of the Agrax Earth Shade. I'm not trying to necessarily do this very heavily and I can tell you that the washes will also dry a lot more muted and a lot and look a lot more subtle than kind of when you initially put them on. But and I liked how that looked, but I, I, I found that you know you can make it even better just by adding a variety of uh, different colors in. So then I made some boards which were picked out here with uh, Seraphim Sepia as well. And I picked out boards too using some, again, Reichlin Fresh Shade for a little bit of a more reddish look on some of them and even Nuln Oil for some that I wanted to look more dark and dingy. And this just is more natural looking because, you know, real wood, you're good, there's going to be slight variance in tone in boards. Next, I'm going to be dry brushing the um, doors, the green doors, which I painted earlier. Uh, I made my first dry brush layer by taking some USA Uniform and just darkening it slightly with the German Camouflage Extra Dark Green and this is a pretty subtle uh, step, relatively speaking, at least in terms of dry brushing, so uh, I'm pressing pretty hard here with what I'm doing. I then just made a lighter version of that color by taking some of the buff titanium and mixing it into the green I already had and I'm just going over the doors in the same way. I'm kind of focusing, you can see those lighter colors towards the center of those wooden areas and then making sure it's a little bit darker towards the edges and that's nice because it uh, simulates both sort of where where people are going to be pushing and shoving on the door and there's going to be weathering happening but also it makes it look like there's just more extra shading kind of underneath the sills and along and near the edges of kind of the door in the building. 
I kind of emphasize that shading weathering effect even further by taking some Coelia green shade wash here and I running a, again sort of around the edges and I was pretty happy with it and I just used my finger again to kind of smooth and blend it out a little bit more into the sort of the central areas where I felt like it was necessary. Now the final detail I really want to do here is to paint the downspouts, uh, the gutter along the roof, and the door handle. So I've taken some Vallejo German Gray here, and I've mixed just a bit of the Vallejo gunmetal in it to give it a slightly metallic tinge, because I want it to look a little bit like a lead, basically. And I'm just going to go in and sort of carefully uh, base coat those areas with a relatively small, a fine brush. Once I finished that, I'm then just going to grab some pure uh, Vallejo Air Gun Metal and I'm just going to use a, a very fine uh, dry brushing type brush and lightly sort of, very lightly because it's metallic and you want to wipe most of your paint off your brush when you do this, uh, very lightly rub over it with that which will just add a very slight extra metallic sheen or kind of gleam to the sort of the extreme edges. Okay, so here's our kind of finished uh, French-Belgian style stable or barn building, which is suitable for World War II or other eras too, really. Uh, this, I hope, has given you a good overview of some of the kind of basic uh, techniques I like to use when I am doing uh, terrain painting and specifically buildings. Uh, working on groundwork is in very, in many ways very similar to what I actually do when I'm basing my models just on a larger scale. But you can see that the techniques you use are in many ways way crude or much less refined than what we're doing on figures. And because it's just a bigger thing, it's, it's sort of more, at least as I see it, more of a backdrop to your models. It doesn't have to be finished the same level or with the same amount of detail that you put into those. But just, I think like this, just some dry brushing and some careful well-placed washes and weathering can really make a really simple building like this just really shine and it'll make a really great environment for your models. As you can see, I'm just showing this to you from a lot of different angles. So you can see just how all the finished um, pieces of the model look. And I've finally included as well a uh, picture with the, um, or a model I should say, next standing next to the building so that you can get a little bit of the sense of scale that we're dealing with here. So I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, please like it, please share it. Uh, let me know what you thought in the comments. Let me know if you want to see more of these terrain videos. Um, and of course, uh, do subscribe to my channel if you've not got a chance to do so already. So that's all for now, and I'll see you next time.